Good morning, everyone. I didn't hear anyone. Good morning. Yeah. Well, welcome to the White House, everyone. Uh, we are just so excited to have you here today. Um, and my name is Angela Barranco. I'm the Director of Public Engagement at the Council of Environmental Quality here at the White House. Uh, we are part of the, president, of the President's amazing energy and environment team, and we are so honored uh, today to host the 2015 Presidential Environmental Education Awards. It's a pleasure to be joined by so many students and teachers committed to growing awareness and understanding of environmental issues in the classroom and beyond. But before I go on, I want to give a number of huge thank yous. Uh, and without these people doing amazing work uh, to get all of you here and to get these awards together, um, this wonderful event just wouldn't happen. Uh, Judy Browse, um, I don't know if I see her, but, and her team at the North American Association for Environmental Education, and Diane Wood and her team at the National Environmental Education Foundation uh, for all the incredible support. And definitely to the entire EPA team, Administrator McCarthy, of course, uh, Brian, Rosemary, Micah, Sarah, and all the EPA interns who really did put a lot of work into this. And finally, a very special thank you to Ryan uh, Robinson. I don't see him, but he's done amazing work um, in making sure that this all came together today. So um, a huge thank you to them. So, let me get to the most important people in the room, though. All of you guys. So you have done incredible work, and you've demonstrated a commitment to environmental education and protection uh, beyond what we could even imagine. Whether you are a teacher and working and developing a curriculum that inspires young people to be passionate about the environment, or if you're a student who worked with your classmates to teach your community about local groundwater pollution. As we look for solutions to pressing environmental challenges from climate change to responsible use of our natural resources to protecting wildlife and open spaces, we need to engage young people. Harnessing their creativity and instilling in them a sense of responsibility for our planet's well-being is one of the most important things that we do. And certainly, President Obama understands this. This morning, we are here to celebrate your ideas and your actions. You'll hear from some of the President's top advisors on these issues and how important the work you are doing is for our country and our world. More importantly, though, we want to hear from you about what you're doing and how we can reach more young people to get them passionate about the environment and the climate. So now to kick things off, I would like to introduce one of the most brilliant students, I'm just going to say, here with us today, Sharon Chen. Sharon is a student doing big things at North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics at Durham. With her project, she has found a safe, inexpensive way to remove copper from treated wood, allowing both products to be reused. This is going to keep millions of tons of material out of our landfills. Her desire to find innovative, science-based answers to environmental challenges has earned her a 2015 President's Environmental Youth Award. So without further ado, please welcome Sharon Chen to the stage. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sharon Chen, and I'm a rising senior at the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. It is a great honor to be, one of, to be a winner of this year's President's Environmental Youth Award. In my research, I studied and developed a green, effective, and novel technology to recover copper from treated wood waste using citric acid and ammonium salts. This technology can offer commercial opportunities for recovering millions of pounds of copper and reusing the wood in landscaping, pulping, energy production, and other applications instead of just throwing it in the landfill. It is my great privilege to introduce you to our next honorable speaker, Ms. Christy Goldfuss. Ms. Goldfuss is the Managing Director of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. She is currently helping to lead the implementation of President Obama's Climate Action Plan. In her previous job as the Deputy Director of the National Park Service, Ms. Goldfuss has tackled a range of environmental problems and has been very influential to the environmental movement. Ms. Goldfuss championed issues in protecting public lands from oil, gas, and mineral extractions when she worked at the Center for American Progress. 
She is a great role model for young people like us, inspiring all of us to act responsibly in conserving and protecting our planet's natural resources. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Managing Director of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, Ms. Christy Goldfuss. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Sharon, for that introduction. Uh, I would love to think of myself as a model for all, a role model for all of you, but uh, the reality is listening and reading about your projects, it is quite the other way around. You are incredibly inspiring in all that you do. Uh, and thank you, Sharon, for giving us a glimpse into what you've done to discover a way to reuse treated wood. It's more important than ever that we find ways to conserve and reuse these resources. There are so many natural resources that surround us, from the trees you, Sharon, discussed uh, and explored to the arsenic-contaminated water that I'm sure we will learn more about from the group from Texas through their project, Arsenic, It's What's for Dinner. It's so exciting to see our country's teachers and the next generation are working towards these goals today. Your work will not only have a major impact on our natural world, but also on our own generation's world, and yes, even your kids' and your grandkids' world, and that's why we are celebrating all that you do today. You are our future. You are the solutions that this world and this country need. But the solutions here aren't easy. From a changing climate to aging infrastructure, our public lands and water face threats on many different fronts. No challenge over the next 100 years is greater or more important than identifying and developing the next generation of protectors of our environment. I know this, Administrator McCarthy knows this, and President Obama knows this. All the work we do right now depends on having a generation like yours to pass it off to then become the leaders and pick this up. All of you have stepped up to the plate. You'll be the one saving species from the brink of extinction, designing green spaces and parks for our cities, and inventing technologies that continue our transition to a clean energy economy. Not only are you finding solutions to protect our Earth, but you are also finding ways to improve human health. I know I speak for everyone at the White House when I say we applaud the work you have done and can't wait to see the amazing things that you're going to do in the future. And a special thank you goes to the teachers. You are making environmental and climate issues a priority and turning these issues into passions for so many students. We deal with the politics here in D.C. all of the time, the fighting that happens around these issues. I just hope and believe that the teachers who are taking these challenges on in the classroom are able to separate from that and really look at the pure science and look at the need and the challenge and what we have to address in the future. It's also important everyone keep up this momentum. Just last month at the White House here, Administrator McCarthy and I met with 75 college students who are presidents of their universities, representing over 1.2 million college students across the country. We discussed climate change and the great work that they're doing in their communities and on their campuses to protect the environment. I hope when all of you grow older and attend college and enter the workforce that you continue your passion to help protect the environment like these students are doing. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see many of you back here at that point participating in one of those sessions as well. Congratulations to all of you. This is really, really incredible work, and I know you'll hear from Administrator McCarthy in a moment, uh, but this is an incredibly special time to be here at the White House as well, as we are tackling these issues on the forefront and making the space for you to continue to do all this work in the future. It is my honor to introduce a very, very impressive young man, uh, just returned from Rome, I believe, uh, Mr. Sahil Veramani from Portland, Oregon. After studying the environmental impact of the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill and other oil, sp oil spills, Sahil reached different methods for remediation and discovered that current methods for oil spill remediation are ineffe inefficient, expensive, and toxic. Through research and experiments, he was able to create a more efficient and novel method. There's that word novel. We hear that in science fairs. Novel is a big thing around here. Method for remediation of marine oil spills and raise public awareness about their environmental impacts. 
Now, I admit, I'm no scientist, but from talking with him just moments ago, it all sounds extremely complicated, but so important and necessary, as we saw with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill uh, and the more recent spill out in Santa Barbara. These are very complicated issues, but so important to our environment that we figure out ways to address them. So, say Hill, we can't wait to hear more from you, and congratulations. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sahil Viramani, and I'm a rising junior at Oregon Episcopal School in Portland, Oregon. The environmental impact of the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill inspired me to develop an alternative method for remediating oil spills. Through my efforts, I have developed a deep appreciation for our marine environment and the need to protect those ecosystems. This is an interest that I share with our next speaker, whom I now have the great honor of introducing the administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Gina, McCar Gina McCarthy. Gina McCarthy has been a passionate, pragmatic voice for the environment. She's had a fruitful career advocating for rational, science-based policy solutions at the local, state, and federal levels. Since earning the position of the EPA administrator, she has been a consistent advocate for effective strategies to protect public and environmental health. The administrator has worked around the clock to put forth some of the strongest environmental protection policies of our country's history. Since earning the position of the EPA administrator, she's, oh, what, yeah. Since earning the position of the EPA, um, her dedication to the environmental education program grows for her vision of environmental sustainability and appreciation of what it takes to make environmental education continue on a path of progress. I apologize for my jet lag voices. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome EP Administrator Gina McCarthy. Do not apologize. Your voice is better than most I ever hear, so it, it was wonderful. Um, Sahil, you are a remarkable young man, and uh, I, I think that your project was just amazing. And I want to tell you two things. In your future, I see two potentials. EPA scientists, that's a good one. We could use you. But also, you'd be a great comms director. Your bio is better than anything my people have developed. <laughs> and the way you delivered it w was great. It made me actually not recognize myself. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, but, but I want to thank everybody who helped to pull this together, because this is always one of my favorite events. So before I talk to all of you superstars, let me just thank the folks who helped put this together. Angela, thank you uh, for all of the work that you do with CEQ. Christy, uh, you're a great partner, and, and it's really important to have the White House on board on environmental issues, because they can reach the big boss all the time and explain to him everything that's going on and keep us on track and focused. But I don't think you will ever see a president of the United States as committed to environmental protection as this one. Um, it is a pleasure to work for him and, and with my colleagues. Um, Diane, thank you for all of your leadership um, at NEF. Uh, it's incredibly important for us to reach constituencies and the public with why this stuff is important. Apparently, all of you out there have already figured this out, but I want this uh, so, sort of to be an auditorium with about 60,000 winning awards next year because we need the public to understand why we have to protect the environment, and why it's so important to grow the next generation of environmental stewards. And so it's great. I want to introduce Ron Curry, who's our regional administrator in Region 6. I'm sure he's looking at the Texas uh, um, winner here uh, with some great pride. Uh, so I congratulate you, Ron, for all that and uncovering all these wonderful people. Um, but I also want to recognize Micah and Brian and uh, Sarah and Ryan and everybody that helped pull this together because it's just incredibly important. And I hope that I've done enough to talk to them so that I can talk to the real people that I actually want to talk to. You guys! So you sh sit down and be quiet. Here's what, here's what I, I would really like to say. First of all, you're sitting in the White House being recognized as an absolute national leader, both as students that are engaged and as teachers. That is a very big deal. Congratulations. You people are amazing. 
So when you go, when you go home, you need to tell your family to treat you special. <laughs> Act like it's a combination of your anniversary, your, your uh, birthday, uh, I, I don't know. Make it up. But tell them that you deserve to put your feet up and have people think big thoughts with you. Because apparently you do that all by yourself just fine and having it a group activity would make it more exciting. <laughs> so let, let's keep making sure that you congratulate yourself because it is actually a really big deal and, and we do it for that reason. It's to inspire other people. And I, I know that I often get asked uh, what is the big deal about environmental education and about getting people engaged. And I cannot tell you how important it is from two perspectives. One is people ask me what the biggest challenge we have in, in the environment is today. I tell them unequivocally the challenge is climate change. And our challenge is that the science is overwhelming but people don't seem to get it. They don't seem to personalize it and make it understandable. And so we have to get people more environmentally literate to understand what science means, not just in the big picture, like big climate, but also in their individual lives. It is essential that we do that. And the second thing I tell them that's most important in terms of our environmental threats, it's the fact that kids don't go outside and play anymore. Now, I know you may not understand that as kids, but we do because I see heads shaking. Anybody that's, well, I don't want you to have to be 60 to figure this out, but anybody that's over 40 will know that they didn't spend a whole lot of time indoors when they were kids because there was nothing there. We were there when we were punished, right? <laughs> I had three TV channels and none of them I could really see very well because of the snow that was on the, and they were black and white when I was born. I hate to admit this, but it's true. And, and I didn't have internet. I had one dial-up phone, you know, that we used to it, I was this. I know this sounds like ancient history, and perhaps it is, and I'm in a state of denial. But it wasn't that long ago. And all we did was play outside. So if you wanted to talk about ecosystems, I saw them every day. I turned over a log, and that was an ecosystem. I had no idea how it functioned. But I knew how little I knew about the environment. And I also knew the wonders of being out in the environment. And I knew how sacred it was to protect. You didn't have to teach me that in school. I already knew it. And so we had an internal feeling of how important it is to protect the environment. Because we understood. I live by the ocean. Go to the ocean at night, lie down, listen to the ocean, look at the stars. It is the most wonderful feeling in the entire world because you get to see the wonder and the beauty of nature and realize that we are not at all controlling it. We are dependent on it, which is why you have to have an agency like the Environmental Protection Agency who is solely interested in protecting public health and the environment because we depend on it for our everyday lives and to keep our kids healthy. So what all of you teachers are doing, let me start with you, what all of you teachers are doing is teaching the next generation of environmental stewards why we have to pay attention to the environment. You're making all of the lessons and the research and the mathematics and the economics that go into decisions that we make accessible to kids in how they do their business and think about running their lives. It is enormously important what you do, and I know that for the most part, you're gonna be fighting to, have, to be able to, to do all that work up against all the other things that we make you do, right? You're gonna try to find the space to make not just the equations memor memorized for kids, but make them alive for the children. And I am amazed at the work you've done. Kids, you didn't need these teachers at all. You're the smartest things. Ever. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, your your uh, work that you have done is actually going to be perhaps the biggest threat to the people in the Environmental Protection Agency. Because you're going to come and you're going to boot them right out of there. The things you have done have been amazing. Well, let me mention a couple. And let me tell you why it's an incredible threat. Lincoln Sudbury High. Now, I have to say this because I'm from Boston. Where are you Lincoln Sudbury High kids? There you are. I'm going to talk about you for one second. I'm going to talk about them, number one, because I live near there. Go, Massachusetts. But secondly, 
because they, they figured out how to put in purified water fountain refilling stations in their school. Now, why do you think that's important? Well, that is absolutely critical because all of us, including myself, are guilty of purchasing huge amounts of bottled water in plastic containers. And what happens to those plastic containers when we're done with them? A lot of them do not get recycled. A lot of them end up in the ocean and gets transferred into microbeads, and those microbeads get, get uh, glommed on to all kinds of contaminants, end up in the fish, and guess what? It either kills those fish or it, 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 it uh, increases their viability as a species, or we eat them. It doesn't sound appealing to me. I didn't order fish with a side of plastic microbeads and contaminants, right? And so it's incredibly important, and, they, and they're making a point with this to teach the other kids. Now, why is it a threat to EPA? We just figured out how to do the same thing in our buildings. <laughs> all right, we're the environmental protection, a field with all these smart, mission-driven people. We just figured this out. And that is because Christie took a message from the president that said, you environmental agencies, no, I'm sorry, you agencies as a whole, federal agencies as a whole, have to start thinking about this stuff. And every single agency went about saying, okay, what are we doing and what can we do more? How do we get, how do we buy renewable energy? How do we get more energy efficient? And we did this survey in the agency and that came up as the number one thing and it was so important to do. But that's why you could end up pushing my staff out of business. And I love it, come on in. Now how about, just a couple more, how about Little Egg Harbor, New Jersey, and the Pinelands eco-scientists, I love Pinelands eco-scientists, the Pinelands are beautiful. I, the reason why I want to mention them is because one of the projects that I have worked on for the past, I don't know, six years or so, was to try to, are you here, by the way, where are you? <gasps> wow, I picked all the front, the people in front, this is, this is not planned, I just want you to know. They, have, have, uh, they are actually focusing on an issue that has really been a passion of mine, which is cook stoves. Now, I don't know if, if everybody here knows this, but two-thirds of the world rely on, on these primitive cook stoves, open fires, essentially, to actually cook their meals. And as a result, it, it is the fourth leading cause of death, premature death, in the world, is cooking with cook stoves. So women across the world, in order to provide their kids nourishment, put themselves and their children at risk from high levels of, of air pollution as a result. And it's because of, and it also puts them at risk because they have to spend all of their time, the kids, out gathering fuel for these, for these stoves. And, and instead of going to school, they're gathering wood for these stoves. It is unbelievable challenge. And so these kids have thought about this challenge, and they have uh, developed this, this um, what do you call it, uh, briquette presses that actually allow uh, an opportunity to get away from good, de good uh, wood and go, go away from deforestation and take a look at how you use bio-waste material and package them into briquettes that are more efficient that would be less polluting, and they'd also save our forests. That is a really cool thing for kids in the pine lands of New Jersey to care about. And they have taught us a tremendous lesson, that environmental stuff is personal and local, but it's also international. And I thank you for your commitment and for the, the incredible work you did to actually get this all tested and distributed in Guatemala. How this happens, I don't know, but I am so impressed. Now, I know, I know I have to close, but I want to say just a couple more things, and I want to mention a couple of the teachers. Because uh, Minuet Rodriguez, are you here? I thought that was you, because I saw your picture. Uh, the Specialized School of Ballet in San Juan, Puerto Rico. How does the Specialized School of Ballet get involved in things like butterfly gardens? You actually do physical models to teach your kids about how the real world works so that it's not just a, 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 a rote exercise, but you're showing them and hands-on so they learn it and internalize it. Congratulations. 
for the work you've done. It's, I found it amazing. And the reason why I like the butterfly gardens is that, is that the president has recently pulled together a pollinator task force to take a look at what is happening with the monarch butterflies, what is happening with the bees, how do we work together, and one of the most important things that you're doing is bringing it home to your kids and showing them that everybody can play a role in addressing even really big problems. So thank you for that. And I know uh, Jenna Mobley also is doing it too. Where's Jenna? Is Jenna, Jenna, you're doing the same thing. You did a great garden with, with uh, all, all kinds of pollinators and, and herbs and stuff for your kids. And thank you for that. It's an incredibly important. But I also wanted to mention uh, one last person who's uh, Robert Hodge, Hodgen, Hodgden. You hear Robert? From Richmond Hill Middle School in, uh, where is it, Georgia. Are you here? Oh, he couldn't be here, so I can talk about him and make things up. This is good. <laughs> no, he actually pulled together a field studies program. The reason why I wanted to mention this is this, is that EPA works very hard, and I know that you guys hopefully will be coming and, and looking at opportunities to do similar work to all of the passionate people at EPA, because they're wonderful. But we have figured out a long time ago that it takes more than 15,000 people in the federal government and people at the state level and local level who have dedicated their lives to environmental protection for us to be successful. Because the challenges that we're facing now actually require educated kids, passionate innovation coming into the system, new technologies, uh, parents who, who are environmentally conscious, in themselves without having the kids have to remind them. We need to internalize it, and everybody needs to get engaged. What Robert did was pretty amazing, because his field studies program, he decided that it would be an after-school activity. He would engage students and parents and staff in going out and actually going in their own communities and monitoring the environment and looking at what challenges they thought were there, bringing data to the table so they could actively engage as advocates in their own homes and in their own communities. Now, EPA is taking a similar, a, a similar approach. We now are relying on citizen science. We now put data on our internet so that it, on our web page, and it's available to everyone about the air quality that you breathe. You have an app on your phone where you can figure that out. You now have an app on your phone where you can look at the water quality in your local streams to see what it looks like. We have to get people engaged. We are dealing with big problems, and we need big masses of people who are saying, I have a right to clean air. I have a right to clean water, I have a right to a healthy home and land, and I have a right to a stable planet. And when all of you stand up and help us show where we're missing the boat, where action hasn't happened, then action will happen. Because still today, information is power. Teachers, you are using it well. Students, you are putting it to use. You are a remarkable synergy of efforts that if everybody could do the same thing, we would not just tackle climate change, but it will turn into the most biggest environmental benefit that this country has ever had moving forward. That's the goal. You guys are going to help us deliver it. Thank you very much. You know, and I, I just want to end by saying that there's a couple of other things going on um, that, I, that I probably should have mentioned and did not. And, and I want to mention them only because I think that the uh, First Lady is a remarkable person, um, as is Sally Jewell at our Department of the Interior. For any of you that are interested, and I know that, that there are not many, we're not dealing with fourth grade level kids here, but I want you to, to look at uh, what the White House is doing and what the Department of the Interior is doing in a program they call Every Kid in a Park. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's to give fourth graders access to, to all of the national parks, and it's coordinated with states as well. Get kids out. Go back, teachers, and demand time uh, in the spring like we used to have. 
to go out and, and do sort of field trips, it would be great. And I know EPA is also working with our um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they're supporting research and on-the-ground work to actually foster the connection between students and nature. And it's going to be an opportunity for us that I think will keep on giving. So while I think EPA is great and the absolute best, White House isn't bad. <laughs> and DOI is stepping up as well. So make sure you talk to everybody while you're here. Soak it in. Get some time. Find some things to do. And we'll all work together and make sure that we deliver our, our kids, these kids, uh, the kind of world we want to hand them. Thanks so much. Thank you, Administrator McCarthy. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Robinson. I'm the Special Projects Advisor in the Office of Environmental Education, or as uh, one teacher said to me this morning, oh, you're the one that keeps calling and emailing me every day. Um, I'm sorry I'm, I did that. I, I just wanted these past two days to uh, be really special for all of you, and, and hopefully we have uh, started to achieve that. Um, Thank you. Um, we wanted all of the winners to come to DC feeling special, but more importantly, we wanted the teachers to leave feeling supported. Um, because that is what the Office of Environmental Education is, strives to do at the EPA, uh, to give educators and stu students the tools and training they need to feel supported and prepared in their classrooms. That is the standard that has been set by the administrator, and that is what has been implemented in our office by our next speaker and presenter, Sarah Soule, Deputy Director in the Office of Environmental Education. Uh, Sarah oversees our office programs that promote the use of environmental education in schools and communities, programs that provide training and professional development and opportunities to educators in the EE field, and like today's ceremony, uh, programs that recognize innovative EE teaching, uh, teaching approaches and student achievement. And while Sarah may not be a you know, classroom teacher, uh, she defines what it means to be a teacher for me. She inspires me to work harder, uh, to think big picture, but still do it strategically. And just like every teacher, she has that lovely red pen that she likes to use during editing papers all the time that makes you wanna cry sometimes, but in the end makes you a more effective communicator, and that's what a teacher is all about. So please welcome to the stage uh, my teacher, my colleague, my friend, Sarah Soule. Thanks, Ryan. Good morning, EE e. achievers, advancers, admirers, and inspires. I'm Sarah Soule, and as Ryan said, I'm the head of EPA's Office of Environmental Education. And I have the pleasure of introducing the awardees who are here today and inviting them to join Administrator McCarthy on the stage where she will present them with their awards. That is you. And before I say those names, um, Ryan wasn't kidding, and I carry it with me <laughs> all the time. I have one with me right now. Um, I will first call forward by EPA region the student awardees and their sponsors who are present. They will be followed by the honorable mention teachers and then the winning teachers. And I will ask you to hold your applause until I have all the have, I've called all the students forward. So as the administrator mentioned, from EPA region one, we have. Michael Bader and Grace Chin, accompanied by their sponsor, Eleanor Burke. Michael and Grace, along with several of their classmates, reduced the school's plastic waste stream and spread awareness about climate change to 1,600 students at their high school in Massachusetts. Here we go. Just stand here. 
With the winning project from EPA Region 2, from New Jersey, Samantha Barton, Michael Caffone, Michaela Crowley, Christopher Naples, Anthony Ricci, Jack Ruiz, and Bridget Zarek. With their sponsor, Stephen Kubricki. This team of students attack deforestation by, design, by designing and distributing low-cost presses that are used to produce briquettes from bio-waste bio materials, which can then be burned for fuel. With the winning project from EPA Region 3 and from my hometown of Fairfax, Virginia, Eugene Zhang and his sponsor, Jeffrey Cordery. Eugene created a process for producing fuel blocks from plant waste materials that can supply heat for cooking and heating while producing little or no net emissions of greenhouse gases as compared to fossil fuels. From EPA Region 4, Sharon Chen accompanied by her sponsor, Dr. Lee Hong Jin. Sharon developed a low-cost green technology to recover copper from treated wood. So no winners from EPA Region 5 are present today, so I'll move on to Region 6. Winners from Whiteface, Texas, and representing their team of eight, Chad Odafua and George Wiebe, joined by their sponsor, Laura Wilbanks. Along with their teammates, Chad and George did research, convened with fuel field experts, and conducted testing on arsenic removal, which led to their discovery of a way to remove arsenic from soil and water in their community. We do not have any uh, PIA winners from Region 7, so moving on uh, the winning, with the winning project from EPA Region 8, Seth Bloom, along with his, pat, his sponsor, Patrick Marty. Seth led over 30 volunteers and senior ecologists in an effort to help restore stretches of the South Boulder Creek that had been severely damaged by flooding. They planted native plants and installed erosion matting to restore stretches of the creek bank.
Now we've got a big group joining us from EPA Region 9 and representing their team of 18 students, Sarah Bautista, Amitabh Bhargavan, Savannah Campbell, Samuel Caudill, Violet Forbes, Aria Huth, Kira Kaplan, Corey Mensinger, Oliver Mensinger, Riley Mahler, James Pendry, Kaylin Tur Turvalon, Ryland Wagner, and Jenna Watts. They are joined by their sponsors, Jessica Campbell and Nathan Rockland. These students raised awareness and money for sea turtle conservation by, among other things, creating a movie, communicating with local and state representatives about the threats to sea turtles, and clearing trash from local beaches. The money they raised helps students and teachers in Indonesian villages. And finally, with the winning project from EPA, Region 10, Sawhill Saw Viramani, along with his spouse, Morali Viramani, Sawhill, inspired to help reduce the environmental impact of oil spills, <laughs> developed and lab tested an efficient method for separating oil. Oh, his sponsor. sponsor. His sponsor, Morali Viramani. I'm not sure what I said, but I apologize. And one more round of applause for our students. Okay, I will now introduce our Presidential Innovation Award for Environmental Education Honorable Mentions and Award Recipients. Once again, I'm going to ask you to hold the applause <laughs> till the very end, and then we'll give them a really hearty round of applause. Uh, from EPA Region 2, Kimberly Preshoff from New York. Congratulations. <laughs> no, no, one at a time. One at a time. From Region 4, we have Kathleen Ann Diggs King from Georgia. <laughs> from Region 5, Leslie Zilstra from Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. 
from Region 9, Joshua Armstrong from Arizona. And from Region 10, Barbara Bromley from Washington State. No honorable mentions from EPA regions 1, 3, 6, 7, and 8 are in attendance with us today. So I'm going to move on to this year's winners of our Presidential Innovation Award for Environmental Educators. They are, from EPA Region 1, Ross McCurdy, a Rhode Island high school teacher who developed a hands-on environmental science curriculum focused on renewable energy technologies. Ross's students applied what they learned to, among other projects, creating a fuel cell-powered Model T and constructing a solar building on the school's grounds. From EPA Region 2, Minuet Rodriguez from the Julian Blanco Specialized School of Ballet in Puerto Rico, who uses engaging strategies to teach her students about monarch butterfly habitats and migration, and about human impacts on the environment related to oil spills and deforestation, among other issues. Also from EPA Region 2, Sven Sternad, a fifth grade teacher in New Jersey who teaches his students about the importance of habitats. In Sven's classroom, his students learn through interaction with live animals and other natural curiosities, including ball pythons, Chinese water dragons, Madagascar hiss hissing cockroaches, and different species of fish. From EPA Region 3, Liam McGranigan from Virginia, who draws on his expertise in birds of prey to teach his students about the natural world. Liam brings the outdoor classroom to life, incorporating studies of native flora and fauna, water quality monitoring, and tree identification into his lessons. From EPA Region 3, also from Virginia, Ann Moore, a middle school teacher who emphasizes critical thinking in her lessons about conservation and ecosystem vulnerability. From EPA Region 4, Jenna Mobley, an elementary school teacher in Georgia, who was successful in getting a full-time environmental education position added at her school. And she's also grown an environmental science program at her school that includes, as the administrator mentioned, planting herb, fruit, vegetable, and pollinator gardens. No winners from EPA Region 5 are present today, so I'm going to move on to uh, our teacher winner from EPA Region 6, Jolie Hobbs. She's an elementary school teacher from Arkansas, and at her school, Jolie started the, the Green News Program to integrate environmental education into the weekly assembly. She inspires stewardship in her students and community by raising awareness of and organizing events focused on issues such as recycling and sustainable farming.
from EPA region. Whoops, sorry about that. From EPA Region 7, Kansas City High School teacher Michael Holtz, who has been teaching environmental science for 30 years. Under his tutelage, Michael's, Michael's students transformed unused space into an outdoor classroom with irrigated garden beds, walkways, and ponds. From EPA Region 9, Lance Powell, a California high school teacher who encourages his students to develop critical thinking skills through outdoor learning experiences. I'm going to go back to EPA Region 8, Sarah Fornis, a North Dakota high school teacher who uses outdoor settings to teach her students about invasive species awareness, bird identification, and other environmental science topics. From EPA Region 10, high school teacher Ryan Monger from Washington, through maintaining a fish, fish hatchery on the school grounds, analyzing bacteria living on common surfaces around the school, like cell phones and weights in the school gym, and participating in community restoration projects, Ryan's students are learning about the local ecosystem in their rural community. And also from EPA Region 10, Robert Shepard from Edmonds, Washington. His outdoor classroom incorporates student, excuse me, studies of local salmon populations, water quality testing, and creek restoration. All of them? Okay. I'm going to just pause and ask the um, students and teacher winners from EPA Region 6, I believe that's Texas and Arkansas, to come back up to the front and uh, Ron Curry to join us. I forgot Ron to get in the picture. So we can get a photo. He's going to be mad at me for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> And Jolie, I believe. <laughs> okay. So how's everybody doing? Can we give our teacher and honorable mentions a big round of applause? So, so before we move on, I'd like to just take a moment to extend um, another thank you. And I know we've heard um, a lot of appreciation expressed already, but I would be remiss if I did not recognize um, all of our EPA regional environmental education coordinators, our regional managers, managers, our regional administrator for their support for these presidential award programs. And I also want to thank my staff in the Office of Environmental Education and in our sister office of public, of, of public engagement, along with our amazing summer interns um, who really worked so hard to bring this event to life. And I would not be complete uh, in, in expressing appreciation if I did not recognize one individual in particular who is the true force behind and the champion of this event. Uh, and to, to say that it would not have happened 
uh, would not be an exaggeration. So I'd really like to recognize Mr. Ryan Robison for his incredible <laughs> effort. It is now my pleasure to introduce Diane Wood, the president of the National Environmental Education Foundation, which is a congressionally, congressionally chartered foundation. Prior to coming to NEIF, Diane was the executive director of the Center for a New American Dream, and she also spent 15 years working for the World Wildlife Fund, including time as vice president for Latin America and the Caribbean programs and vice president for research and development. She has also worked in many specialties in environmental education, ranging from curriculum development to nature interpretation and conservation education. Diane served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Paraguay and as a consultant to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Peace Corps, and the U.S. Agency for International Development. She has a master's in science and environmental education from Cornell University. Please join me in welcoming my cherished colleague and friend, Diane Wood. Good morning. Sarah and I email a lot, so I have not been blessed with the red pen. I will start to look at it in my email text, but thank you very much, Sarah. And good morning. And on behalf of the National Environmental Education Foundation, also known as NEEF, I am really pleased to congratulate the Environmental Educator Awards and the Youth Award, the awardees, for um, their fine work. It's really a privilege to be here. It's sort of a highlight of, for the year. For those of us who are really working in environmental education and hoping that environmental education is happening anywhere and everywhere where it's needed throughout this country, a chance to be with fellow environmental educators or environmental educatees is absolutely fabulous. And I think, um, Administrator McCarthy, you'll get your 60,000 people in this room with this kind of passion and talent represented here today. So I'm delighted to be here. And um, I look forward to getting to know all of you a bit better um, after this session. I run the National Environmental Education Foundation, known as NEEF, and this was established, we were established by Congress to work closely with the EPA to advance environmental li literacy nationwide. We're about helping the public understand their relationship to the environment and what you can do to steward the environment. And we're really proud of our relationship with the EPA. The law that established our organization encouraged us to develop public-private partnerships in collaboration with the EPA to support environmental education, and that's why I'm standing here today. Because today is an opportunity for us to present the Richard C. Bartlett Awards, and this is a competitive award that is made available only to the Presidential Environmental Educator awardees that are here today. The Richard C. Bartlett Award is offered by NEEF and the Bartlett Foundation in collaboration with the EPA. And it's a way to acknowledge teachers who best represent the late Richard C. Bartlett and his passion for leadership and environmental education. Some of you may know Dick Bartlett. If you're from Texas, you may have heard of Dick Bartlett. He was a larger than life Texan who was also the CEO. He was a larger than life Texan and also the CEO of Mary Kay Cosmetics. And for four decades, he promoted environmental education. He was an incredible believer of the power of teachers to integrate concern about the environment into school programs. And in his honor and with the support of his, his widow, Joanne Bartlett, we created the um, Bartlett Award. So what we're going to do today is recognize three teachers um, who have done an amazing job in integrating environmental education into their schools. And I want to tell you this was not an easy process. EPA, you really know how to pick your awardees. This was a very challenging process. I think my staff who are here, who I hope you all get a chance to meet, um, aged a great deal in trying to make these choices. So I'd first like to acknowledge Sarah Lord as a Bartlett Merit winner. Sarah's not here, but I still want to tell you just a tiny bit about her work. Sarah's from Billings Senior High School in Billings, Montana. And what's intriguing about Sarah's work is that she has been developing programs in her environmental high school science programs that bring young people into the classroom who have zero interest in science. And that's really been her goal, is attracting students who may not have been interested in science 
And what she's done is with hands-on experiential learning has engaged students in science in ways that had not happened before. In particular, she worked with the Salvation Army on addressing local food disparities and then worked with her students to present their findings to their community. And her, report, her work was recognized as a model program by the Montana Education Partnership. So I'm sorry Sarah couldn't be here today, but just wanted you to know a bit about her fine work. And next, I would like to acknowledge Ross McCurdy from Ponagansett High School at Situate, Rhode Island. And Ross, can you come on up? You've already been up here, but I'd like to bring you back up on the stage. I'm just going to have you stand here while I tell a little bit more about your fine work, and I'll give you, our, you know, the award. Ross is what we call supercharged to science classes with more than just fuel cell technology. He gives lessons a boost of fun and intrigue that captures students' attention and drives their interest in renewable energy far beyond to the end of the school year. What started as a small-scale lab investigating fuel cell technology in the classroom quickly expanded into many more complex renewable energy undertakings. Will you hear this? Such as the world's first fuel cell powered band, electric bicycle fabrication, solar shed construction, a hydrogen fuel cell powered hot rod, a biodiesel powered 3,000 mile coast to coast road trip. I really want to hear about that. A biodiesel equipped airplane flight and more. In each of the projects, Ross used this compelling subject matter to capture students' attention and allow them to decide how it will be put into practice, instilling a sense of investment in the project and consequently in improved learning. Graduates of his class come back to Ross. They've continued on to internships and careers in the renewable energy fields. This is just what's so wonderfully powerful about environmental education, inspires, engages, and then really charts people onto a future they might not have ever had um, the idea to, to um, follow through if they hadn't seen, had these kinds of experiences. So Ross, I'd like to present you with the Bartlett Merit Award and congratulate you for your fine work. Thank you very much, Diane. And hold this, maybe we can get a photo. There we go. congratulate you and Thank you so much. We don't much. have to stand right over there. We can, are we, we doing okay to here? Find the X. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks Look so forward much. to talking to you more. It's a big honor. And now I want to acknowledge Sarah Forness from West Fargo High School, West Fargo, North Dakota. Sarah has taken experiential learning approach to science lessons in her high school field biology and environmental science classes. Why don't you come on up too? showing all the students the relevance of what they're learning and making it real and meaningful in their lives outside of school. And I'm sure all of you share this, whether student or educator, that, that what you're learning in the classroom when you have a chance to apply it and share it in your community and make, your, make a difference in your community, it really lasts. And I think we find that over and over again in environmental education, this outreach in communities and the sense that what you're learning really does apply to your daily life and improves your communities. So I love what you've been doing. Her projects have involved local water quality monitoring, forestry labs, soil sampling, insect ecology, bird identification, and many other topics. And as I was saying, many of her programs really lead up to community involvement and education, such as student presentations to their urban forestry work, of their urban forestry work, to a panel of natural resource professionals, the production of public service announcements about invasive species awareness, this I love. Creation of unused pharmaceutical drug drop boxes to keep harmful chemicals out of our water supply. I hope you can bring from North Dakota some of those for, for us here in Washington, D.C. It's so important to do this for our water. And other successful community-based applications of student learning. So the lasting impact of these lessons is undeniable. As students have continued on, to internships, extracurricular pursuits related to lessons from her class, and even return from graduating from her class to help teach current students and stay involved with the programs. And although Sarah may be the catalyst for many of these programs, she has also found ways to involve other teachers throughout the school. And that's something really powerful of being able to take environmental education and engage all, all um, members of a school community. 
So she has had um, the woodshop class help build two stream tables for studying river morphology. She's involved the engineering teacher in helping on a solar bikeathon, and she's invited the STEM program to join in the water quality testing for, and plans. And she has plans for many more collaborations. So please join me in acknowledging Sarah Forness's fine work um, with the presentation of the Bartlett Award. Oh, good. All right. All right. Thank you. So thank you again, and I again want to congratulate CEQ and EPA, and especially the fine work of the Office of Environmental Ed. They are wonderful colleagues, and it's a wonderful team to work with for the great work they've done that's represented by all of you here today. So thank you very much. I look forward to getting to know all of you better. <laughs>